with Kevin McCarthy out as speaker. The fight to see who will be the new speaker has officially begun, and a couple of people entered the race. Let's find out who exactly is running. Also in the news, we have people getting mad at my reaction to something that was publicly posted online. Let's respond to the comments. Also, we, yet again, have an article by MSNBC about how Trump should have zero rights. Let's dig into all of that and more on today's episode. Facts over facts over tracks, this and that, spitting slow, spitting fast, I could roast, I could gas, think I'm okay at last, but I don't know if that can erase all the past. Okay, so starting off, we actually have a Federalist article. We have how conservatives quietly outmaneuvered weekend McConnell's on, how conservatives quietly outmaneuvered weekended McConnell on Ukraine. As you may have known, McConnell is not the best person for the job. I think that he should step down because he's just getting too old. We keep asking him questions, and then he just does not know how to answer, and then he just goes off to a, uh, a haze, and he just does not answer any of the question because he's just sitting there thinking. So it's just weird. So I think that he should step down. We should get somebody that is a lot younger, and um, I think that's about it. Like, we should just get somebody that's younger. We should get somebody that's more experienced. Uh, I guess we should get somebody more conservative, not just more experienced. We should get somebody that's more conservative. Now moving on, we have McConnell quietly acknowledged to his colleagues that the Senate bill, including Ukraine funding, was not winning issue for the party. People keep saying this. This is not a winning issue for the party. This is not a winning issue for the party. Well, the winning issue for the party is whatever we push through the hardest. So if we sit here and we say, no, this is not a winning issue. Did we even try on the issue? Most people in America polling publicly say that we do not need to fund Ukraine anymore. So if most of the majority of the people on in this uh, country here in America, most Americans say that we do not need to fund Ukraine anymore, why are we still funding it? How is that not a winning issue for Republicans if the majority of the country does not want to fund Ukraine at all? So we're just doing what the people want. So how is not doing what the people want not popular? That does not make any sense. So. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell suffered a stunning blow to this weekend when Republicans in the upper chamber discharged his repeated calls for prioritizing Ukrainian funding by passing the House GOP short-term spending bill, which included no provisions for the Zelensky regime. Um, publicly, McConnell pretended his move to finance his, the proxy war in Ukraine was temporarily tabled for the convenience of avoiding an in in imminent government shutdown. Behind closed doors, the Senate minority leaders plan to indefinitely send United States tax dollars to U Eastern Europe was shunned by nearly every member of the party who expressed discomfort with hinging the fee of the government shutdown on Ukraine. One source familiar with the situation told the Federalists that even though McConnell quietly acknowledged to his colleagues that any spending bill that included Ukrainian funding was not a winning issue for the party. Yes, it is. Like I said, it's popular amongst Americans. Yet, he was so committed to putting down another country's financial well-being ahead of his own that he fought for his own conference on it. Um, the Senate GOP's defiance of McConnell was confirmed when they, at the urging of the Senate GOP steering committee members like Sen Senators Mike Lee and Rick Scott, passed House Republicans' continuing resolution, CR, instead of the Senate bill. When I came in on Saturday morning, I was convinced by we were going to win. The headwinds were totally opposed to us. And then by one o'clock, we had this is this deliberately we had defeated McConnell. A Senate staffer told the Federalist corporate media and Beltway insiders paint the Titanic twist that as a sign that the longest serving Senate party leader in the United States history is losing control of his conference. The Senate Republicans who defied McConnell and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer's expensive spending package, however, are simply finally harnessing the collective decision of making power they've always had to better reflect the parties in this consultants. The, me the mechanics that made it happen. Spending negotiations did not start looking grim for McConnell until just one day before FY 2023, spending was set to expire. And up until that point, McConnell was armed with his deal, the support of the Pentagon, and, propose, and prepared to send billions more to United States tax dollars to Ukraine. It's rumored that Pentagon officials are on their way over to the Capitol to lobby for Schumer McConnell. The military-industrial complex does not like to lose, Lee wrote on X, formerly known as Twitter. The 
package was standard for the Republican leader who had sent, spent the last two and a half years pressuring his colleagues to join Democrats in subsidizing the war in Eastern Europe. McConnell previously argued that sending Ukraine money without oversight is obviously in America's self-interest because it benefits the vast United States military-industrial complex. Of Republicans should welcome Democrats who are finally willing to spend money on our defense industrial base. McConnell demanded on his September 11 Senate floor remarks, such a bipartisan cons consensus will not survive if we turn our backs on this conflict. Yes, it will, because the vast majority of Americans believe that Ukrainian funding should be cut and we should instead focus on America instead of Ukraine because America needs, its, needs our help today. Needs our help because of the fact that we're suffering with these high interest rates. We're suffering with everything that's happening in the economy. We're suffering with high gas prices. And we're suffering with astronomically high prices when it comes to uh, uh, house prices or car prices. So it's just upsetting. The minority leader's insistence that Ukraine needs an endless stream of United States tax dollars was supported by a majority of these colleagues over the last two years with few objections. Polls, however, show that sending an endless supply of cash is increasingly unpopular with the American people. With the 2024 election nearing, Republicans in both chambers quickly realized that they couldn't afford to risk their congressional careers over another forever war to appease the defense of the industry and their alliance and their allies and congressional leadership. Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy confirmed on Friday night that, or former Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy confirmed on Friday night that the Senate's misguided bill, which included funding for Ukraine, would be dead on arrival. McCarthy's firmness was unsurprising given the job pressure he faced with from members of the House Freedom Caucus who wanted to leverage their GOP majority power to address the surging border crisis, vanish the weaponization of the federal government, and cut off American censorship of the proxy war. Senate Republicans' grumblings about lining Zelensky's pockets also preceded the weakened fight, but rarely made it beyond the walls of their offices. Despite wariness from the House Republicans, and his conference about indefinitely funding an overseas war, McConnell doubled down on his quest to pass his own legislative package, which catered to Zelensky's pleas for cash. While he prepped for a closure vote in the Senate, House Democrats prepared to support the McConnell bill, which a procedural motion to take over the floor. Senate insiders told the Federalists that all the time they believed that would happen. House Democrats understood that waiting for the Senate to take their first closure vote on the Schumer-McConnell package would have forced the burden of the shutdown on the GOP, which would have had to choose to pass the Senate bill with Ukrainian funding or shut things down. The move would have also likely provided the heat to oust McCarthy over speakership, something Senate Republicans like McConnell would likely disapprove of. The Democrats in the lower chamber tried to use every trick in the book, including magic minutes, in pulling a fire alarm to delay the House CR vote and make the Senate decide on the bill first. Okay, so, of course, the Democrats um, sit here and deny all allegations that they actually pulled the fire alarm because of the fact that they wanted to delay the vote. Um, of course they would, because of the fact that if you did pull the fire alarm to delay the vote, then that's actually disrupting Congress, which is, you go to prison. So, of course, they're going to deny all the allegations that they actually did this to hold the vote. Now, I don't really care what they have to say about this. They did delay the vote. And it was a false trigger of the fire alarm just because of the fact that you pretended as if you do not know how to read an emergency door to get out the building. It's just stupid. So this person actually used an emergency exit only and used the fire alarm to supposedly unlock the door. But then as soon as he triggered the fire alarm, he ran out the other side of the building. So it does not make any sense at all. By midday Saturday, however, Senate Republicans were toying the idea of the abandoning of abandoning the high level spending proposed by Democrat and GOP upper chamber leaders in favor of the House the House's CR, reclaiming possession of the party. Senators Lee and Scott specifically proposed during a Saturday conference lunch that Republicans in the upper chamber wait for their House GOP colleagues to send over the stopgap, 
Waiting for the House bill, they argued, would rid them of the burden of passing legislation that goes against Americans' wishes on Ukraine, keep America, keep Republicans from becoming shutdown scapegoats, and harbor McCarthy from the threat of removal for a little longer, which it did not. Um, even shadow leadership race candidates, Senators Conlon and Thone, who started September by eviscerating House Republicans for opposing Senate Union Party spending bill, expressed support for the plan so they would be seen as sympathetic to the conference that might one day choose them to lead the party. By the end of the lunch, McConnell and Senator Susan Collins were the only GOP senators who voiced disdain for passing the House's CR. McConnell was eventually forced to publicly declare Republicans' intent to pass the stopgap in an attempt to maintain his appearance of control. Schumer tried to stifle the vote by starting a live quorum, which requires all senators to con convine in the Senate chambers to fulfill their duties to vote. Republicans were prepared to either take down Coulter or abstain from voting altogether, but Schumer eventually re relented and left his bill off the table. The Republicans had successfully defied McConnell and delayed Democrats' spending wishes, wish list until mid-November. Despite suffering defeat on the short-term funding bill, McConnell is not giving up on his dream to keep Ukraine in the running for the future appropriations negotiations. He opened his floor speech on the passage of the CR by pledging to send the Zelensky regime even more money before the end of the year. Quote, I am confident that Senate will pass for their urgent assistance to Ukraine later this year, McConnell said. It's difficult to predict where negotiations will go in the next month. The momentum of the Senate GOP will collectively make its own decisions without McConnell. However, is there and waiting is there and waiting for them to grasp it? So um the thing is that Ukraine, yes, I agree with the CR, does not need any more money. So that right there I totally agree with. But for the most part, I do agree with most of them, but the thing is that McCarthy actually helped defy McConnell, and that's exactly what Republicans wanted to do. Just because of a few Republicans, um, I think it was actually like two or three of them, they didn't like um, Kevin, Mar Kevin McCarthy so much, so they just voted him out. We actually talked about that at the earlier of the week, so it's, a, it's just, um, I don't know, I just... I think that we could have gave McCarthy a, um, a greater chance over here. He could only get so much done, especially with a caucus like this. Um, yeah, so I just think that they should have just gave him more of a chance over here. But I do hope that the next person that we have as a House Speaker is Jim Jordan, because Jim Jordan is actually in the running. And a couple of other people's are, people are actually in the running also. So I think Jim Jordan is one of the most conservative people right there in the, in the Senate right now. So... Or not in the Senate, in the House of Representatives. So, um, Jim Jordan, but I do believe Rand Paul, which is all in Congress, I think that he's actually really good too. So, if we can actually vote Rand Paul in, or his father Ron Paul in, that'd be great. Because, it, oh my god, you know how much spending cuts we would get if we had those people in charge? They know how to artic articulate themselves so good. We would cut all the spending, and then they would just be like, okay, let's cut some more. But Jim Jordan, I think he's a great guy. So if Jim Jordan is in the running. We actually need him to be Speaker of the House because that would be really good. He took on everybody during COVID, just like Ron DeSantis. Him and Ron, Ron him and Ron DeSantis. Oh my God, Rand Paul, Jim Jordan, and Ron DeSantis during COVID stood up to the tyrants and said, "No, nope, we're not going to do this. This is exactly why. This, this, and this, and this." Rand Paul actually fried Dr. Fauci on the Congress um, floor. So it, it was just an awesome viewing experience for that. I did watch the whole entire compilation of both of them roasting Dr. Fauci. And I think that whenever we go against our, our, our quote unquote officials, I think it's a good day for America. But with that being said, we're going to be digging into the, um, the media's takes on this matter because of the fact that Hillary Clinton has something to say. So with that being said, we're going to be digging into the media's takes. Okay, so digging right in, we actually have a CNN article. We have Clinton calls for formal deprogramming of MAGA cult members. In an interview with CNN's Kathleen Anapur, 
Former Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton discusses why she believes supporters of for former President Donald Trump were intimidating sane House Re GOP members and calls for a formal deprogramming of MAGA cult extremists. Now, I think that we should also call for mass deprogramming of the left movement and the, and the Antifa movement because of the fact that Antifa and BLM more broadly is a, is a mental health disorder that actually makes you look at the world as if you are the only victim and nobody else is a victim in this world. You're the only victim and everybody has to do things for you because you matter more than that. That's the deprogramming that we need in America because of the fact that we should not be looking at ourselves. We should be looking outward. We should be looking at our families. We should be saying, what can we do for our families? Not what can you do for me? That's the outlook that we as Americans should have. Now, we're going to be just watching some of this because this is two minutes and I already think that's way too long to be listening to Hillary Clinton. So we're going to be watching about 10 seconds of this and let's see if I actually get tired before that point. So when you look at how to go forward for the countries, you say, is there any area of coalition building that could happen? There are pragmatic Republicans, as you say. Could there be a new, a whole new way of trying to, you know, get legislation going and cross-party governance going by Democrats and certain Republicans forming a coalition? Well, you saw uh, the number of Republicans who voted along with Democrats to keep the government open. So there's clearly a common sense, uh, you know, sane uh, part of the Republican caucus in the House. Okay, so I already uh had enough of this. So... I mean, this, like I said, this is already too much time for me to be listening to Hillary Clinton. So you're, I'm surprised I even lasted that long. So she's just going to say something stupid about, oh, Republicans need to sit here and we need to keep the, um, the government open. Listen, the government does not actually just shut down. No, there's still things that have funding. Okay, TSA is one of them that do not have funding because it relies on federal funding. State employees for the most part, are still paid because of the fact that there's an annual budget that the um, that America goes through, and it's designated for those people. So ma the majority of things are still open. Still, government workers are still getting paid. And even if you are working and you're not going to get paid maybe by the end of the week, you're going to get paid eventually. So if you have bills that are due this very week, yes, that's a little bit hard for you. But also at the same exact time, we should have an emergency funding just for these cases. Because of the fact that you never know when there's going to be a time that we say, no, we're not going to have all of this BS spending and we need to put it towards our debts. So that's exactly that. Obviously, Hillary Clinton does not want to be paying off her debt because she's a Democrat. She just wants to be giving, giving, giving. And she does not want to be paying off her debts at all because it's somebody else's money. She doesn't care. She does not have to face the repercussions of her own actions because she's going to be passing away very soon, like within the next like 10 years or so. So, without, um, with that being said, we're going to be just moving on to the next article because that was way too much of Hillary Clinton for the day. Moving on, we do have another CNN article. We actually have government shutdowns aren't really shutdowns, but they are ba a bad deal for everyone. Wait a second. This is exactly what I was... Well, I wasn't really saying the, the latter part. I was more saying the former part. I was saying government shutdowns aren't really shutdowns. So, it's funny that CNN actually contradicted Hillary Clinton in that aspect. So, a government shutdown, as we've come to define it, is expected starting October 1st if lawmakers can agree to pass a spending bill. Okay. It will affect everyday lives, creating headaches for government workers who can't get paychecks, costing taxpayers billions in lost productivity, and cutting off certain services. Okay, so you're acting like we're not going to get paid at all. No, you're just not going to get paid this week. But most of the government, as it touches people's everyday lives, will continue to churn. Um, mail will still arrive. Social Security benefits and Medicare programs will still be paid. Claims will still take off. Soldiers and border agents will still report for duty, although without a paycheck. Um, that some lawmakers are using paychecks of the government workers as leverage in the spending fight is insane to Max Steer. He's CEO of the Partnership of Public Service, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization whose goal is to help that build a better government, and improve the performance of the government, which basically makes him a professional cheerleader for several services. Okay. So here he is right here, trying to make the government better. But 
what see they don't really explain what his politics are because if you're in politics if you're trying to control the government we need to know what your politics are if you if you're grounded in reality and saying we need to cut down the spending or else we're going to default on our debt then that's one thing but if you're trying to control the government and it's spending and you're saying oh no we need to take control so then we can just spend astronomically then that's completely a different story um this um i just read that i called him to ask I asked him to, I called him to ask how a shutdown would affect people, and he started off by arguing it is completely wrong to view what is approaching as a shutdown. Experts of our conversation conducted by phone at, are below. If you really shut down our government, our society would go kablooey. The 30,000 foot question might seem pretty obvious to a lot of people, but not to everyone. What's wrong with the government shutdown? I'm going to run counter narrative here for a second. The bottom line here is that the government shutdown is not an Am Armageddon, but it's a really bad deal for American people, and we will use the term government shutdown what, when that is not actually what's at play here. Three quarters or so of the federal budget is actually mandatory, meaning that it's the money that Congress doesn't really appropriate every year. It happens accident. It happens essentially automatically. Can you take me by Feel better again. What the hell is this? CNN just starts playing an ad. I'm just in the middle of reading their article. Where even is this ad playing from? I don't even. <laughs> there's no ad on this page, and it just starts playing music. I got scared for a second. I get scared actually really easily, so that's actually really funny. What's at stake here today is about a quarter of funding that our government uses to do its work that is appropriated on an annual basis, even on an annual appropriation where the activity of government involves the protection of life or liberty the government actually continues even without an annual appropriation what's at stake here today is about a quarter of funding that our government uses to do its work that is appropriated on an annual basis even on that annual appropriation where the activity of government involves the protection of life or liberty the government activity ac continues even without the annual appro appropriation if you really shut down our government our society would go Kablooey. It would be the truly end of our society as we know it. Our enemies would be able to enter our country unimpleted. Business would halt. Pretty much zero transportation. It would be an absolute chaos. What's at stake in the budget battles that are taking place right now isn't that. The damage that would be done to our country is nonetheless important and severe, but most of it would be hidden from obvious public view. Because most of the things that you see, feel, the experience as an American will continue forward. Okay, so they're taking all of this out of proportion. And they're saying, we need to do funding right now. Our government will just shut down and we're just going to go, oh, and we're just going to explode. I don't rely on that. I don't rely on Social Security benefits because I'm not older. I'm not retired. That's number one. Number two, I don't rely on public transportation. Um, if we, I mean, we can technically count airplanes as public transportation, but I do have pre TSA pre-check too. So TSA pre-check is actually, um, privately funded. So that is actually not reliant on the government because I actually pay a yearly fee for it. I would, I would say like once every four years is a fee. So that goes into a fund, a slush fund. And then they use that slush fund to, to pay their TSA privately. So you don't actually have to rely on the other TSA agents, which are just sitting there screaming TS pre TS TSA pre check is just a overall good thing. I do recommend it, but that's a little bit of a side check, a side chat over there. Um, yeah, so that's that's a ba basically it. So like we just said, CNN is actually doing some pretty good reporting on this matter because of the fact that they're interviewing somebody that actually knows what they're talking about. That should be the in end of the interview right here. So I just don't know why they have. Oh, wait a second. We have we have Anderson Cooper over here and we have Wolf explaining what this actually means. What do you mean explaining what this actually means? We just heard it from the expert. It's not a big deal, so stop making it a big deal. That's exactly what they're saying. So with that being said, we're going to be digging into the MSNBC article, which is actually worse than CNN, but I do appreciate reading them because it's just entertainment at this point. And yes, my allergies are really bad. So if I sound nasally and congested, yes, I am. Um, moving on to the next article, we actually have an MSNBC article. We have DeSantis. I'll take accreditation from schools with DEI programs. The Florida governor said that he'd totally blow up the accreditation 
cartel as president by stripping schools of their official recognition if they have DEI initiatives. Good. Good. This should happen. This will incentivize schools to have a black only this or a black only that or a um, Asian only graduation or this or that. Like That's just stupid. No, we should not have this. This is not kindergarten. This is not preschool. No, you're an accredited school and we need to start acting like grown-ups. We need to sit here and say, no, we're all equal as Americans under God and for the pursuit of happiness, okay, in the American dream. So that's what we're here for. We need to stop pretending as if we need to look at race before we make judges on other people. No, we're not going to be doing that because in the eyes of Martin Luther King, we need to have colorblindness. And they say, oh, no, colorblindness is racist. No, it's not. Not looking at the a person's skin color before talking to them is not racist. So I don't really care what you have to say at all. Moving on to the next article from MSNBC, we have judges can't keep letting Trump act this way. They must impose gag orders now. Listen, no, that's stupid. He has a First Amendment right. He's allowed to speak on the matter of his of his um cases if he does so choose. But the problem for him is that he likes speaking a little bit too much. So he gives away some things in his lawyers. If I was his lawyers, I would be like, guy, you need to shut up right this second. You're exposing things that they should not even have known if you just kept your mouth shut. That's what I would have told him. But of course, it's Trump. What do you really? Trump is just going to run his mouth no matter what. So Trump is going to talk about the cases that Trump's involved in. And nobody likes talking about Trump more than Trump because Trump is Trump. OK, that's just that. Moving on to the next article, we actually see, I don't even read the Samus NBC articles. These, the first one was from Jan Jones. The second one, or no, the second one was from Jan Jones. The first one was from somebody else. So I'm not going to read these. This I will read. Um, we actually have a Daily Wire article. We have school investigate students who choose to use private bathrooms for implicit harassment of transgenders, which is just stupid. After an Illinois school implemented a policy that allowed students who said that they were transgender to use the bathroom of their choice, it said the non-transgender students were uncomfortable with the decision could opt out to use the bathroom in the nurse's office. What the school failed to anticipate was that so many students took up on the offer that the line for the nurse's bathroom began forming down the hall. That's awesome. I would join that line immediately. The... Um, mis miscalculation caused the superintendent to say that students were harassing the transgender students by opting for the private bathroom, according to the records obtained by parents defending education, and shared first with the Daily Wire. Well, this is just absurd. You offer something, and then when they take up that offer, you say, that's transphobic. No, you're transphobic if you're going to go by that line, because you're the one that came up with the idea. And that's just stupid. Um, the miscalculation, okay, I already read that. When biologically male st high school students came forward and stated that they were uncomfortable with biological female students using the male restrooms, we told those students that they could use the nurse's restroom. Waterloo Community Unit School District Number 5 Superintendent Brian Corlone wrote on to parents on March 17, it was an effort to support those students' comfort, but unfortunately it resulted in a disruption. Yeah, you're the one that caused the disruption. The male students planned to use the nurse's office restroom at the same time, resulting in a line. He said, saying that the students coordinated to use the bathroom at the same time to highlight how the new bathroom policy affected them. Okay, so this is a protest. Shouldn't you be glad that students are banding together and actually using the, the, the resources that they have available from the education that you are sadly teaching them to actually coordinate something and to show a message wouldn't you be f proud as a superintendent that they're actually listening to the teachers that you hired in your district because if they did not know how to protest then the teachers would not be doing a good job as a teacher so isn't that something that you should be putting yourself on the back for and saying wow these students actually learn a good education that's exactly the reason why they're actually doing this so look at it as a, in a good light but of course you're not going to look at it in a good light at all um, some students were already pushed by being marked tardily or absent for waiting in the bathroom stall, he wrote. Students who attempt to repeat today's actions will be dis disciplined for attempting to cause a disruption in the school. The letter said, these before Sharon's letter, the school board had passed a policy that said transgender students can use the wrong bathroom as long as the student developed a gender identity plan with school officials. Carlone Moore, vice president of Parents Defending Freedom Education, um, you know, parents defending education said that it is not harassment for students to use a private restroom. Students have every right to push back on the school's policies that do not align with their belief systems. It is not harassment, Moore said. 
what should be considered school inflicted harassment is allowing oh i can't talk is allowing students to use the locker rooms slash bathrooms that do not align with their bi biological sex in creating situations for potentially um, physical violence and sexual assault on school property. Documents produced by Waterloo in response to the public school's request also included a training presentation that included a gender unicorn. The presentation said that the school's ob objections are not to act in loco Parentis, and not to reveal students' identities to anyone else, including the students' families, without students' permission. The training included a copy of, the, of something similar to the Gender Identity Plan, a document from the activist group Gender Spectrum called the Gender Support Plan, which explains this, that staff caregivers, if appropriate, and the students should work together to develop the document on how the students' athletic gender will be accounted for and supported at school. Um, why do teachers care so much about this? I'll tell you, because of the fact that they want to get your student while they're young, because of the fact that they're not going to ask as many questions as what me and you would ask. Me and you, watching this right now, already know these trannies have no bear in reality. They have no um, grounding in reality because of the fact that they just they just have a mental disorder. It's not grounded in any reality whatsoever, so we know for a fact that they don't have any facts backing them up. So with that being said, we're the ones that have the facts by our side. They are not the ones that have the facts by them side. So they can't sit here and expect us to just um, say, oh, never mind. Oh, no. Oh, 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 reality is not a thing anymore. No, reality is a thing. And we're going to stick by reality time and time again. So with that being said, that's going to be the last episode. I mean, the, the last um article we're actually going to be going over on this episode so thank you all for watching thank you all for listening and if we do if you do like this episode please like and subscribe down below because i do post new episodes of the show every single monday wednesday and friday thank you all for watching and i hope they have a great rest of your day and hopefully by monday's show all of these allergies go away because it's really annoying so thank you all for watching and i hope they have a great rest of your day bye